Today we're going to introduce some key concepts from thermodynamics. In particular, we'll look at the first law of thermodynamics and we'll look at four important processes for a gas in a piston. Whenever we start a new topic, we always start with the simplest system first. And our simplest system is going to be an ideal gas inside a piston. So our gas is going to be ideal. It's also going to be monatomic. And everything that's not the gas, such as the piston and the walls of the cylinder, etc., that will be part of the environment. We like ideal gases because we can use that relationship PV equals nRT, and we also know that for an ideal gas, none of its internal energy is coming from potential energy of the molecules. It's all coming from the random kinetic energy of the molecules. So let's take our very simple system and do the simplest thing that we can think of to it. That is, we're going to add some heat energy to our gas. So we're going to put a flame down here below the gas, transfer some heat energy to the gas. And we're going to ask ourselves, what can possibly happen when we do that? Well, of course, the first thing is that the gas atoms can speed up. And of course, when they do that, that means there's an increase in temperature. And that means the internal energy of the gas, which is the sum of the random kinetic energies of all the molecules, is also going to increase. So we'll have an increase in internal energy. And we use a delta U to represent the increase in internal energy. Now the second thing that can happen is, of course, that the piston can rise. Now if the piston rises, that means the gas is doing work to lift the piston. So the second thing that can happen is that the gas does work to lift piston. And we'll represent that work by a capital W. Now the next thing you want to notice here is, well, Q, that's an energy term, heat energy. Delta U, internal energy, that's an energy term. And work, of course, that's joules, that's energy as well. And we've got this thing called the law of conservation of energy. What do you think the relationship will be between Q, W, and delta U, thinking in terms of the law of conservation of energy? So hopefully what you said is, if you're adding heat energy to a system, and there's only two things that that system can do, and that is there's only two forms of energy that can be created, then the sum of those two forms has to be equal to Q. In other words, that heat added has to equal the change in internal energy plus the work. And this statement here, which is really just a statement of the law of conservation of energy, is called the first law of thermodynamics. Now all of these terms can be positive or negative, so be a little bit careful with that. If your gas is absorbing energy, then of course Q is going to be positive. If your gas is giving off heat, then the Q value is going to be negative. Delta U, the change in internal energy, if you have an increase in temperature for a gas, that means your internal energy increases. If you have a decrease in temperature, that means your internal energy is going to decrease. Delta U will be negative. Be especially careful with the work. If the gas expands, in other words, the gas is doing work on the environment, then the work is going to be positive. If the gas contracts, and that means that the environment is doing work on the gas, then the work will be negative. And I think you'll find when you look in a textbook, you'll usually see the first law of thermodynamics written this way. Delta U equals Q minus the work done. So you've got that change in internal energy on the left hand side, and that's because the change in internal energy is a little bit special, because we talk about that change in internal energy being independent of path. Now when we studied electricity and magnetism, we talked about something that had independence of path, and that was the electric potential. When we studied electric potential, we could have a point A and another point B, and we could talk about the potential at A and the potential at B. And what we said was the change in potential didn't depend on the path. It didn't depend on what motion you took to go from point A to point B. The change in potential is the same for any path. Now it's going to work very much like that for this change in internal energy. 
instead of having points in space, we'll have states of the gas. So we have a gas in, say, a state A, and another gas in a state B. And then we could talk about the gas having an internal energy at A and having an internal energy at B. And then the path taken to go from state A to state B will not affect delta U. It's going to be the same for any path. Now, what do I mean by the state of a gas? You'll have a unique state of the gas depending on these variables, pressure, volume, number of moles, and temperature. And those are just the variables from the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law was that PV equals nRT. So often this equation here is called the equation of state. And when I talk about different paths to go from one state to another, from one value of PV, N, and T to another value, I'm talking about how the changes were made. Was the change made at constant temperature or constant pressure? Was work done or was no work done? So there's different ways to change from one state to another. And so the path is no longer through space. The path is the transformation from one state to another. In our first law of thermodynamics, we've got three variables. We've got the heat, change in internal energy, and the work. And what we want to do now is look at each one of those individually and see what tools we have available for calculating each one. So we're going to start with the internal energy of an ideal gas. And the big message I have for you about internal energy is when you're thinking internal energy, think temperature in Kelvin. And the reason for that is you'll remember that internal energy is the sum over all the atoms or all the molecules of their kinetic energy plus potential energy. But if you've got an ideal gas, then there's no bonding. There's no potential energy. And so it's just the sum over the, all the kinetic energies. And of course, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy per molecule, which means that for our ideal gas, our internal energy will vary as temperature in Kelvin. In fact, the IB gives you an equation that U is equal to 3 halves times the number of moles of the gas. In the problems that we look at, the number of moles is going to be constant, times the universal gas constant, which is that 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin, times the temperature in Kelvin, of course. But be a bit careful when using this equation, because it only applies to monatomic. So in a monatomic ideal gas, there's no bonding between the atoms. So it's really f referring to the noble gases. However, if you have one of those noble gases, you're going to be able to write that the change in internal energy will equal 3 halves times the number of moles of gas times the universal gas constant times the difference between the final temperature and the initial temperature where you write those temperatures in Kelvin. Let's now consider the work done by our gas, and we're going to take the simple case where we have a constant pressure. And you're going to get a constant pressure anytime you've got a freely moving piston. So here where we've got a piston on its side, we'd have atmospheric pressure pushing on the gas, and of course the gas would push back with an equal and opposite pressure. And you'll recall that pressure is equal to force divided by area, which means that force should be equal to pressure times area. So if we want to calculate the work, which would be equal to the force applied times the distance moved through, and let's suppose our gas expands and, and moves through a distance here, delta x, then the distance would be delta x. And our force would be equal to the pressure times the area. The area that I'm referring to is just the area of the piston right here. So what you want to notice here is that as the gas expands, it's going to have a change in volume equal to the volume of that little cylinder. Of course, the volume of that little cylinder is the area of the piston times delta x. So this quantity here, A delta x, that's the change in volume. And so we get this expression for the work done by a gas at constant pressure equal to the pressure times the change in volume. 
but this is also a useful expression when the pressure is not constant because we can then think in terms of an average pressure. Now we don't have a lot to say about the thermal or heat energy being added. When we studied thermal physics and we talked about specific heats and latent heats, we had two expressions for heat added. For solids, liquids, and gases, you could determine the heat added by using the specific heat capacity. And when you had a phase change, you could use the latent heat of fusion or latent heat of vaporization to determine the heat added. Now there's four special paths or processes that make our lives a lot simpler. I'm going to start with the adiabatic process. In an adiabatic process, there's no heat flow. Q is equal to zero. And the way we would obtain that is, well, there's two ways of doing it. One is to have an insulated container and an insulated piston. Because then the system is thermally isolated from its environment and heat can't flow. There's a second way of obtaining it, and that's just to move your piston really, really fast. Heat takes time to flow, and if the piston moves too quickly, there isn't time for heat to flow. And that's what happens in the power stroke of a car engine. Very little heat is lost during the power stroke. It's during the other strokes of the engine that all the energy is lost to the environment. Now, if we think about the first law of thermodynamics, and we write that delta U is equal to Q minus the work, then in this case, that Q will be zero. And we can say that the change in internal energy will be the negative of the work. Which, for example, would mean if we compress our gas, that's a negative work. And that's going to result in an increase in temperature. And remember, when you're thinking about internal energy, think temperature. So if you're increasing the temperature, that's a positive increase in our internal energy. So you can see how these two signs hold up. If the internal energy increases, it was negative work done. The second major type of process is called isochoric. Isochoric simply means at constant volume. And of course, the way that you have a fixed volume is either not to have a piston at all or you fix your piston so it can't move. And of course, if the volume doesn't change, the gas can't do any work. And that means W is going to be zero. So that from the first law, delta U is equal to Q minus the work, and the work will be zero. So that you can say that the in change in internal energy will equal the heat added. So we might add some heat energy to our fixed container of gas, and that would cause the temperature to go up, and it would cause the internal energy to increase by an amount equal to the heat added. The next simple process that we want to introduce is called isobaric. Baric, think barometer. This one's going to be at constant pressure. And you'll recall that any time we have a freely moving piston, then we're going to get constant pressure on our gas and by our gas. And when that's the case, then we have a simple expression for the work done. And we can write our first law of thermodynamics as delta U is equal to Q minus P times the change in volume. And keep in mind, for this type of process, where we've got a constant pressure, the volume is proportional to the temperature in Kelvin. So if we double the temperature in Kelvin, we should get twice the volume for our gas. And our last, but certainly not least important simplified process is called isothermal. And it's just what it sounds like. It's going to be done at constant temperature. Generally, the way that we get changes at constant temperature is we have our piston and we put what's called a heat reservoir. It's a large heat sink. And it's at some temperature. I'll call it TR for the temperature of the reservoir. Now, as long as we move our piston slowly, then the temperature of the gas will stay the same as the temperature of the heat reservoir. So it's going to be done at constant temperature. Now, if you're at constant temperature, that means the internal energy of the gas isn't changing. So when we write our first law, change in internal energy equals heat minus work, 
the change in internal energy is going to be zero. And that means that the work done will have to equal the heat added. And don't forget this isothermal process, constant temperature, that means during this process, P will vary as 1 over the volume. So if you half the volume, you're going to double the pressure. Okay, here's an IB question. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So hopefully you realize this was isothermal. That means there's no change in the internal energy of our gas so that the work done has to exactly equal the heat added. So our correct answer is C. Here's an IB question. Pause the video, read the question over, try it over yourself, come back for the answer. Okay, let's put the values in. We were adding some heat and it was 8,000 joules of heat energy that was added. That caused a expansion here of our gas and the change in volume was equal to 0 0.1 minus 0 0.05 which is equal to 0 0.05 meters cubed. There was also a constant pressure pushing on the gas which will of course equal the pressure of the gas and that was equal to 1.2 times 10 to the fifth pascals or newtons per meter squared. So the first question asked whether it was isothermal, adiabatic, or neither. Firstly, in terms of it being adiabatic, that would be a definite no, since Q is not zero. It's equal to 8,000. Secondly, it's not going to be isothermal, because if we think about the ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT, we're keeping this at constant pressure. That means that the volume varies as the temperature. So if we're changing the volume, we've got to be changing the temperature, and that means it's not isothermal. So the correct answer here, of course, is neither. Part two asked for the amount of work done by the gas. The work done will equal the pressure times the change in volume, and that'll be 1.2 times 10 to the fifth pascals times 0 0.05 five meters cubed. Multiply that out, you should get 6,000 joules of work done. And then in part three, you're asked for the change in internal energy. That's going to equal the heat minus the work done, which will be 8,000 joules minus 6,000 joules, giving an increase in the internal energy of 2,000 joules. IB question, pause the video, try it out, come back for the answer. Okay, if there's no change in the internal energy of the gas, that means that there's no change in the temperature of the gas, so you want to do this at a constant temperature. And that means a heat reservoir will be required, and you'll have to have a slow motion of the piston. Secondly, if no work is done, that means that there's no compression or expansion of the gas, that means you've got to do it at constant volume, so you'd use a fixed container, no moving piston. And thirdly, if you're going to have an, a diabatic change where no heat flows into or out of the system, that means you want an insulated container. Or the other way that you could do that is simply to have a very rapid motion of the piston, such that there's no time for heat to flow into or out of the system. Another IB question, pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So we have two scenarios to compare here. In both cases, the piston moves so that the volume increases from V1 to V2. That's the same in both cases. The first case, though, is isothermal, which means you must have a heat reservoir here that's going to keep the temperature constant. So there's got to be some heat flowing into the gas here. And we could work out the work that was done. That would equal the average pressure times the change in volume, V2 minus V1. Now, let's compare it to the adiabatic case, where you've really got an insulated cylinder, so no heat can flow. If you're not adding any heat, well, naturally, if heat's being added here, these molecules are going to be moving faster than these molecules here. And that means you're going to have a higher pressure on this system on the left compared to this 
system on the right. So if I think about this work in my second system, it's going to equal a lower pressure times the same change in volume. That's a lower average pressure. And that means this W2 here must be less than W. And the correct answer is therefore B. Note here, you could only have zero work done if there was no expansion at all, if the gas stayed the same volume. Let's summarize the big ideas from the video. The first idea was this first law of thermodynamics. And it was really just conservation of energy. And it said that the change in internal energy will equal the difference between the heat added and the work done by the gas. When we're thinking about internal energy, we want to think about temperature. Because the internal energy of an ideal gas will be directly proportional to the temperature in Kelvin. For the heat added, we didn't have a lot to say. We might in the future be able to use our equations when we talked about specific heat capacity and thermal heat capacity. And then finally, for the work, if we had a constant pressure, we could say that work would equal that pressure times the change in volume. And then we looked at these four processes. There was adiabatic, isochoric, isobaric, and isothermal. So for a diabetic, no heat flowed into or out of the system. Isochoric, the volume is constant. Isobaric, the pressure is constant. Isothermal, the temperature is constant. So if Q equals zero, then our first law simplifies so that the change in internal energy must be the negative of the work done. If our volume is constant, that means that the work done must be zero and our first law simplifies to the change in energy is equal to the heat added. In an isobaric process, that's kind of handy because we'll be able to use work equals P times delta V because then we have a constant pressure. And then finally, in the, for the isothermal case, that's when there's no change in the internal energy of the system, which means that the heat added will have to be equal to the work done. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.